Hey, this is Matt Whitmer from Brody Precision. In this video, we are continuing our Intro to Niagara series. The first video, we went over installing Niagara and getting it up and running on your computer. And in this video, we're going to take a broader, big picture look at the architecture and the way that this software is designed and the way it runs on your computer and in uh, your JSIS, the physical hardware that runs Niagara. So let's uh, jump into a little PowerPoint presentation here. We're not going to be doing any practical playing with the software in this video, but if you're coming here for that kind of thing, we'll be getting back to that in the next video. So let's get started. All right, so Niagara is made up of three main software components. Uh, we have two kind of serverish uh, pieces, and then we have our workbench. This is the actual tool that we're playing with and we're doing programming with. We're interacting with our JSES and our supervisors and that kind of thing. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit more depth in the next slide. Uh, but the other two pieces of the um, Niagara picture here are our platform. This is sort of what is, uh, you could almost think of it as like the windows of a Niagara environment. It does the basic system level functionality, things like allowing you to start and stop stations, IP addressing, software management, file system management, that kind of thing. Um, that's all done directly on the platform and that is done across all platforms. So uh, whether you're running Niagara on your local computer or a virtual machine in the cloud, or on a JSE. They all have a platform that looks and feels the same exact way. You might have slight differences in the kinds of things that you can manage and do, uh, but generally you're looking at the same kind of functionality. Uh, you can see here I have the ports listed as well. Um, red of, for both this and the station are going to be our unencrypted port. Typically, you're not going to be using that now unless you're logging into a legacy station that's using an older version or something like that. All of the defaults for all of our servers, uh, servers that we're going to be connecting to are going to be TLS encrypted, and they're going to be using port, um, in this case for the platform, port 5011 in order to make that um, connection happen. The next piece is the station. This is like our project. This is the core functionality in Niagara. Um, it's where the logic happens. It's where our device communication happens. Alarms, histories, graphics. The web server is a component of our station. So what you'll see here is that our station has um, a port that we connect through, which is 4911 on the TLS side. Legacy um, unencrypted port was 1911. And then we also have a web server, like I mentioned, that's running inside the station that is using our typical ports for um, the web, which is port 80 on HTTP, which is the unencrypted side, and then 443 on the encrypted side. Again, by default, if you make a new station, and we'll see that in future videos, uh, you're going to default to using TLS, um, which you absolutely should be doing. So if we look at this little um, diagram here that I put together on the right, this gives you a sort of a bigger picture idea of what's happening here. We've got our workbench. Uh, you can almost think of this as a client application, and it's allowing us to make our connections uh, to the devices and servers that may be running um, stations somewhere else, or it could even be local. So from Workbench, we're connecting to our platform, we're connecting to our station on our local daemon, our local uh, instance of Niagara, or our JACE or our supervisor that might be running somewhere else. And then these devices can also make station-to-station -station connections themselves without having Workbench involved at all. Um, and we can see that with this M2M -M or machine-to-machine machine connection that's happening here between our local daemon and this JS9000. So as I mentioned, uh, Workbench is the actual client software. It's where you get your wire sheet. It's where uh, you set up your points. All of that stuff is Workbench. That's the main part of the tool that we installed. Um, and it looks a little bit like this uh, image here on the right. It's worth noting that Niagara and uh, Niagara is rebranded by a lot of OEMs. So you see it come in a bunch of different flavors and a bunch of different names. Behind the scenes, it's basically all the same kinds of things with some additional functionality added on top for whatever the particular brand needs for their controllers and um, specific functionality. 
uh, but they go by different names. So we've got Workbench, we've got Workplace, which is sort of a Vicon nomenclature. Um, Optimizer Supervisor is the Honeywell stuff, and then Emolytics is what Phoenix calls their version of it. Um, another piece that's worth noting is that nowadays in Niagara 4, a lot of this functionality that we would have had to jump into the Workbench application for, we can now use directly in the web browser when we're connecting to a station that's running somewhere else, uh, which makes our life a little bit easier if we're going to configure and set up a station that's running somewhere else and we don't maybe have access to a local install of Workbench. So when we installed Niagara, we got a bunch of different executables, a bunch of different things pop up in our start menu if you chose that option at the end, which you very likely did. And uh, so we've got five pieces here, uh, first of which is an alarm portal. This is sort of a standalone application that we can use for alarm monitoring. Depending on your use case, uh, your end users, this might be something that they're interested in if they don't want um, full access to graphics and programming and that kind of thing. They only want to see alarms when they come in. This is a good option for that. Uh, there is a console that's installed as a part of the uh, installation, and this allows you to manipulate your workbench, station, and platform all from a command line interface. And uh, it gives you a lot of functionality that you have from the user interface, uh, but gives it to you in that command line style if that's a uh, preference for you. And then we have our install of the platform daemon. This installs the, um, the platform for the specific version that you run the uh, little script uh, executable for. And this is required only if you're going to run stations in that particular version. If you only need to connect to a station that's running in a JSON or a supervisor in a particular version, you just need to run the uh, workbench for that version and then connect to your sites through it. No need to install the platform daemon uh, in that version. But if you say switch over to a different version because you need to work on locally on a station for a job, uh, you'll need to install that platform daemon first. And then once you do, you can open up workbench, you can connect to your local platform, and you can start that station and run it as you need. Uh, our fourth uh, executable here is our workbench. We know what that is. That's the client tool that we mentioned before that gives us that graphical user interface to manipulate our station and our platform as we need to. And then there's also an additional version of that which also runs a console alongside the workbench. So once workbench comes up, there will also be a separate window command line interface. And this is really helpful if you're having uh, workbench specific issues. Say workbench just doesn't open when you click on the, the workbench um, shortcut. If you open up the workbench console shortcut, you'll very likely see an error message that you wouldn't have otherwise known about if you ran just Workbench by itself. So within uh, this whole Workbench um, installation and with your platform daemon and your uh, stations, we've got a whole bunch of different locations on our computer where files are going to live. Uh, this is a little bit confusing. Um, especially if you've played with Niagara AX, the previous iteration of Niagara, um, and you're moving to Niagara 4, this is, a, this is a change. We're a little long in the tooth now on Niagara 4, so you very likely um, may be familiar with this, but it's worth going over again uh, just so that you're aware. So our first home is going to be our system home. This is the location where basically our files are installed that we're running. So the workbench executables, all of our modules, our licenses for our workbench all live in this system home. And it's typically going to be your C directory and then the brand that you're using and then the version. So in this case, I'm using a Vicon install. It's going to be C, Niagara, and then Niagara version. Next one, we have our daemon user home. This is the... Um, Location where our files are living for um, our stations that are running and actually uh, 
available to us within the daemon. Uh, it's what you would see when you go to the application director underneath your platform. Uh, it also includes some additional configuration data. Uh, so if you need to tweak specific settings about how stations are running on your uh, computer or on a supervisor, this is the location of uh, those configuration files as well. This lives underneath uh, C program data, which is a hidden directory. So you'll need to uh, allow uh, showing of hidden directories within Windows. So it's C program data and then our version and then the brand. Uh, which is a little bit different than the system home. So will the be C program data, Niagara 414 in this case, and then Vicon. And then our last piece is the workbench user home. This is all files specific to the workbench for the user that you're logged in as. Uh, this is where station copies happen to. Uh, this is where backups happen to. Uh, and it's specific to the user that you're logged in as in Windows. So it lives underneath the users directories on Windows. So it would be C users and then the username, the version, and then the brand. So in my case, it's C users administrator, Niagara 414, and then Vicon. And then we get to another little piece of files. I mentioned it before. This lives in our system home and then underneath the modules directory. Uh, modules are sort of uh, what makes each individual piece of Niagara work. Basically, when Tritium was building out Niagara, they split up functionality into these little bite-sized parts so that we can easily add in additional features um, and extend Niagara, which is one of the major benefits of using um, Niagara versus other systems is that that extensibility is, a, is available to us. And uh, this kind of extensibility is typically used for like if you want to communicate with a legacy system or legacy controllers or uh, a network that isn't supported out of the box in Niagara, you can get a third party module that will allow you to do it. Um, these are may or may not be licensed features. Um, and there may be advanced features that you uh, wouldn't normally install that if they're not licensed, you don't install them, say, on a JACE. But if you do get them licensed and you are going to use it, you could install it in the JACE. Again, uh, freeing up uh, file space and resources on your JACEs and uh, the like. The other thing to note about these modules is that they all typically will be the .jar file extension. And then we get to our licenses. This also lives in the system home, and it's going to be underneath security and licenses. I did mention this briefly in our install video, and the um, license file is really just a plain text file. So uh, it has a li dot license uh, file extension, but you can open it in a text editor, and you'll get something along these lines. Uh, it's a little bit confusing to look at if you haven't looked at them before, but you'll be able to figure it out relatively easily because it's all human readable format. This is where things like the max version that you're licensed for is defined. Uh, your station device and point limits are defined and then specific features may or may not be licensed depending on whether or not you paid for them and added them to the uh, specific license. All right, so that's sort of the basic uh, software architecture, the way things are laid out in Niagara. Uh, I just wanted to give that broad overview before we start diving into um, more detail and actual functionality and actually using the software and, and um, playing around with it, give you a better picture of what you're uh, actually dealing with and what the Tritium engineers were thinking when they built out Niagara. As always, thanks for watching, and uh, we'll be continuing this series with a whole bunch more videos, so be su sure to subscribe on YouTube here, uh, and comment with any additional features or um, use cases and functionality that you'd like to see covered more in depth in this uh, series. And as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Thanks.